Ugh. God, why is Nynaeve still so salty about Moraine? Get over it already. Classic Nynaeve. Yelling at people, getting angry for no reason. I will make her curse the day her mother laid eyes on her father? Well, damn. That's kind of badass. Okay. Wait a second. Nynaeve? Nynaeve is actually kind of cool in this chapter? What is happening? Welcome back to another video. I'm going to be talking about The Great Hunt today, which is the second book in the Wheel of Time series. I already talked about The Eye of the World, which was the first one, so if you haven't seen it, you can go ahead and check that out. And if you have seen it and you're coming back for this video, I just want to say thank you because I've honestly just been so blown away by the support that the whole Wheel of Time community has given me. I had no idea that this fandom was just so nice. Like, I I'm just so surprised. I don't know, like I feel like with a lot of fandoms it can kind of gatekeep and that has just not been the case at all. And I'm just so grateful to have been welcomed with open arms, even with my shitty opinions. <laughs> In the last video I, I kind of had like a spoiler free and then a spoiler section, but going forward I, I don't really know if that's gonna be too feasible because there's just gonna be like less and less to talk about in the spoiler free sections. So this video is mostly going to contain spoilers. Just heads up if you haven't read it. You might want to read it first and then come back. So first off just some like overall things about The Great Hunt. I really loved this book. I think that I actually liked The Great Hunt more which is kind of surprising because I really loved Eye the World. I don't know if it kind of had to do with the environment as well. This is like my favorite season so I think it really played into it. It was the most wonderful experience just curling up and reading the book. I actually thought that the pacing was significantly improved as well. It definitely didn't feel like it was too slow in parts or it was meandering or just taking too long to explain things. I feel like something happened every single chapter so I definitely think that that was an improvement from the eye of the world. I also feel like the world just really expanded in this book. I mean not only were we taken to different cities but we also heard a lot of new history and lore that just really expanded this world and man I loved those scenes that I mean I guess they're exposition scenes but I loved it. They just opened up the world and I'm like yes this is what I want this is what I'm here for but before we go further into the video the pressing question that I know you're all thinking do I still hate Nynaeve yes <laughs> okay I don't hate her as much surprising I know shocking okay look here's the thing there were still several scenes throughout the book that I just don't understand why Nynaeve is so salty all the time. I don't understand it. I, I just don't fully get her hate towards Moraine. Here's an example. I forget the exact context of what was going on, but she just kind of went on a little bit of a monologue about how much she hated Moraine and what she did to Perrin, Matt, her what all of them. She blames Moraine for whatever happened to them and it's not Moraine's fault and I don't understand how she could think it's her fault. Sure, she is manipulative in her own little way and I think we as a reader get a better view at that than even Nynaeve but I just, I don't understand the saltiness. I just don't get it. Maybe it's like a self-esteem issue or she just has a hard time dealing with her anger in general. She has some growth work. That's all I'm gonna say about that. I, I will admit there was this line. I died laughing. Like I laughed out loud when I read it. She said, if I cry right now, I will kill myself. And I just thought that was so funny. I can appreciate Nynaeve for that. I can relate. Actually, I can't relate. I cry so often. But regardless, I thought that was hilarious. It was not a good moment for her, but it was funny. And she was more relatable in that moment. But, but, the part that I actually started considering that maybe I didn't completely hate everything about Nynaeve, when they were like turned over to the Demane and they had to like fight themselves out and Egwene got captured, then I actually started really liking Nynaeve because I think that she really started to channel, channel her angry negative energy into something actually positive. And I started to like, okay, if you can actually have this kind of a growth and be maybe a little bit more uh, useful 
with your anger, then we could go somewhere. And then maybe I'll start to like you a little bit more. The, the one line where she said, I will make you regret the day that your mother laid eyes on your father or something. Like, oh my god! Okay! Okay! I like this. <laughs> I read all of your comments and most of you were saying that you didn't really like Nynaeve at the beginning either, but you eventually grew to like her and I still think that that is possible. I mean, just because I hate someone now doesn't mean that I won't like them in the future. I'm on the journey and there was a little bit of a hint that that could change. And I'm hoping she uh, has some more like really epic badass lines. So the book pretty much opened where the last book left off. So there wasn't any like time in between or anything. And it really kicks off with the Amerlin seat and that whole like conversation really sets off the conflict. That conversation with the Amerlin seat and Moraine was one of my favorites to date. That whole conversation I just thought was so good. Not only was it character development for Moraine that it kind of shows a little bit more of her backstory, but it really opened up all of the political stuff that kind of goes on with the Aes Sedai that hadn't been shown to us yet. And I loved all of it. Like the whole brown and green and red and blue. Just so cool. I love all of the distinctions and how they're different from one another. Also, why are the red Aja such bitches? I mean, I, I can understand their ideology and stuff, but like, why are they so rude? When they were in that conversation and they were like planning these things out, I immediately was like, uh, yeah, shit's about to go down. Everything that they're planning right now most likely won't happen because we all know if you make a plan, it's gonna go wrong. I also love the, the scene where they were telling Rand about him being the Dragon Reborn. I love that they just kind of came out and said it and there wasn't a whole lot of dancing around the topic. They were just like, so come in, welcome. Uh, you're the Dragon Reborn. <laughs> It's just so casual. I just thought it was hilarious. <laughs> I mean, I guess it's kind of like what Rand needs. He needs to be told something very straightforward, no confusion, even though he still was confused after and Rand. Oh, sweet Rand. I was really kind of annoyed though when Rand was kind of a jerk to Perrin and Matt for just a really dumb reason. I just really hate in books when friends are mean to their friends for manipulative purposes. Even if it's like to help them or to save them, Rand wasn't actually feeling those things. He just wanted to protect them so that they wouldn't want to go with him. I just hate when people do that. Like why people aren't like that in real life. I hope. I just hate the manipulation aspect of it. Even if it is for a good reason. Oh, I don't like it. It just feels bad. And then also Perrin and Matt believed him? I mean, they've been friends for their whole lives. Can they not tell that Rand is not being sincere about this? And then also when he tells them that he was like, oh, I was just being mean so that you wouldn't want to follow me. They don't believe him or accept what he's saying and are like, we still don't want to be friends with you. One, they should have caught on that he was lying. Two, you forgive your friends. I mean, he didn't say anything that awful. <laughs> I was just a little bit annoyed with that little subplot at the beginning. So speaking of Rand, Perrin, and Matt, I'll go into a little bit more of my thoughts on each of them and kind of what they were doing in the book. Matt was kind of so toxic in this book. He was just mean to Rand. I mean, I get that Rand was mean to him. He would just give him the cold shoulder. He would ignore him. He would walk away from him. I mean, I guess he and Perrin did that. Rand would ride up on his horse to be next to Perrin and Matt and then they would go back and they just, they just didn't want to be with him. Perrin at least got over it and forgave him eventually and kind of realized that, okay, yeah, whatever. He didn't actually mean it. But Matt like took it to heart or something and then got super jealous. It was just really toxic overall. He was like really triggered by the fact that Rand wore nice coats and stuff and just thought that he really believed he was this incredible figure and powerful and whatever. I was just like, Matt, Matt you're okay. Like, he doesn't actually believe that. You should know. Like, y'all are friends. Like, he's not actually being just this pompous. Clearly, there's like some, some manipulation going on from Moraine, but Matt just doesn't see it. He was just kind of toxic and not a very good friend through most of the book. And he did eventually get over it just at the very end though. Still wasn't like super crazy about Matt, but I think that now that he's not being as influenced by the dagger in the next book, he'll have a better personality or it'll kind of shine through a little bit more. Now with Rand, I really, really liked Rand's character arc in this book. His slow descent into using the power more, it really did come across 
very seductive and very tempting to use. And he really like went from not wanting to use it at all, and he still doesn't want to use it, but he went from using it like once or twice to just slowly kind of talking himself into it and talking himself into situations. And really you could feel like how seductive it was. I just thought that that was so well written on Robert Jordan's part, but it really showed how believable it is for the Dragon Reborns to actually go into madness. And I like that he was kind of slowly starting to accept that he was the Dragon Reborn throughout this book and also an Aiel, you know, because <laughs> he looks completely different from everyone and so many people keep telling him that he looks like an Aiel. And he's like, okay, maybe maybe Tam wasn't my father and uh, maybe I'm an Aiel. Also, when he when he ran into Celine, I really loved his interactions with her because he's just such a dumb kid. I mean, oh my gosh, he is stricken with her and is completely obsessed with her. So he's not able to see how suspicious she actually is. As a reader, clearly we know that something is up. She is not trustworthy and we know that, but Rand clearly being very stricken has no idea because he just sees pretty girl, nothing else. <laughs> I did kind of think that she probably was Lanfear. It wasn't just super obvious when we first met Celine because she was kind of like maybe damsel in distress, but then the more things she said, the more you're like, hmm, probably shouldn't trust her. And then it became kind of more obvious that she was Lanfear a little bit later in the book. I'm excited about her. She seems like a very interesting character. And then with Perrin, I think we had just so many more good scenes with him than we did in the last book. He wasn't in a good chunk of the book and I did kind of take notes while I was reading. It was like, uh, where's Perrin? <laughs> he has not showed up in several chapters. He just seems like the most wholesome character. I don't know why, but in my head, I kind of picture him as like a Samwise Gamgee kind of a character. And I know that the probably isn't really accurate, but in my head, that's just kind of how I picture him. Just because of how wholesome he is and how kind he is. I just like him so much. And he finally started accepting his abilities and using them and oh, that's so cool. Like he actually started using his abilities when it when he had to and he was forced into it and then realized that maybe it's not the worst thing ever. But you guys made a lot of really good comments in that last video because I was like, why are you using your abilities? Like this is the best thing ever. It, he wasn't accepting what had happened to him because he wanted nothing to do with it. And all he wanted was his normal life in Emmons Field, working as a blacksmith. And that whole life was kind of taken away from him. And he really was having a hard time adapting back Back into society but I'm glad that he's finally accepting it and hopefully he stops being so ashamed like every time that he did look down just in shame and can't look people in the eye I just feel so bad poor Perrin but I'm super interested to see how he continues to use it in some of the other books because that is really cool I also thought that Egwene had some really awesome chapters too like when she got to Tarvalon and met Elaine and started using the power and honing her skills a little bit more I thought it was a really cool way to see two different levels of training that kind of happened with Aes Sedai. Like we got to see Nynaeve doing her trials and kind of that next level up. But then we also got to see kind of the base level where everybody kind of starts. And I thought that was really, really interesting. Also just love her dynamic with Elaine. I think that it's so awesome that they're friends and they kind of just hit it off right away. And also men. I just love men so much. And I love all of their kind of dynamic together. Even though I'm, I'm not crazy about Nynaeve, I still love all of their conversations that kind of happen when they're all together. They just have some really good chemistry mystery and I love it. <laughs> Man, there's gonna be some romantic drama. And even though I know that the relationships aren't like a huge part in the series, I'm always here for some drama, some romantic drama. I'm here for it. <laughs> I guess it'll probably include Min, Elaine, and Lanfear. I guess Egwene is kind of a little bit out of the picture because of the whole destiny prophecy thing, but also she did kind of choose the Aes Sedai over Rand, so it makes sense that she's not really in the picture anymore, even though at the end it did seem like she wanted to be, so tension. I do want to say that I actually really did like that Egwene and Rand had a little bit more to do with each other in this book. They thought of each other a lot more. There were definitely times where Egwene was thinking about Rand or Rand was thinking about Egwene. That was one of the things that drove me crazy in Eye of the World. They're supposed to be kind of these maybe star-crossed lovers, but they didn't really interact at all. Like it didn't really seem like they cared about each other very much, but in this book they actually did seem like they cared about each other. So some story elements that I really liked. I really thought that the whole 
whole Demane thing was a really cool. I thought that the whole moral element to it was really interesting. This is just kind of how their society has handled the people who have access to the power and they really don't see what they're doing as evil. It's just how they've decided to handle it. Egwene's master wasn't cruel for cruelty's sake. I mean, she definitely did a lot of cruel things, but it wasn't out of malicious intent. Maybe the other ones are a lot more malicious, but it did seem like she was trying to train her in a way that she saw was morally okay. Clearly to us, this is not okay, but they have rationalized it in this way, and it was just a very interesting perspective. Also, when the girls were turned over by Leandrin, I was so surprised that that happened. I guess I just assumed that she was maybe like doing something nice for them. And then I was so shocked that that happened. I didn't even realize what was happening until Egwene had the collar on her. I was like, wait, what, what, what just happened? And I didn't even realize that she was technically a black Aja until the end of the book. I don't know. It just didn't click in my head. I guess I just assumed red Aja equals bad and then just was like, oh yeah, she just did an awful thing because she's red Aja. I guess all red Aja aren't evil. It just kind of came across that way because they're all kind of bitches. But then at the end of the book, Moraine mentioned that the black Aja are back at it again or something. And then it kind of clicked in my head that, oh, she's black Aja that makes sense now. I don't know. I'm just slow on picking up on some of those things, I guess. And then I didn't know why Egwene just gave up so easily. Clearly she had some really horrible things done to her and she was tortured and it was not a fun experience at all, but then she just kind of accepted it. And I just was like, Egwene, your friends are going to save you. Do you not know that? I was just kind of surprised how easily she was pacified. She just kind of gave in and then didn't really try to keep fighting. I mean, I understand that the collars kind of make you completely submissive because you, if you even think about trying to escape, then it like makes you really nauseous and you throw up and bad things happen. But she just gave up so easily. I'm like, Egwene, they're going to come for you. It's not over. You don't have to start imagining your life as this forever. So yeah, a little sad for Egwene that she doesn't feel confident in her friendships or something. Also, another plot point. The multiverse? This is a thing? <laughs> Okay, when I came across this part in the book, I was like, what the frick is happening? This is a thing in this series? I am very excited to see where that goes and what the heck is going to happen because obviously this is going to be a thing in the other books. I'm sure of it. I don't know to what extent the fact that there can be these alternate realities and different dimensions kind of happening at the same time, I feel like opens up so much to happen and that could happen. It could go back and something be changed. This is kind of what I was talking about when I said the world just really opened up because the fact that there are multiple dimensions <laughs> in this book series, in this fantasy book series. I was so surprised. I was not expecting it at all. I feel like anything could happen at this point. Another chapter that I loved is the what might be chapter. Holy crap. <laughs> that was such an awesome chapter. I actually don't really know what happened, whether they lived like these multiple, multiple lives and they remember everything from them, or if they just saw like flashbacks from different parts of those lives and different multiple realities and different possibilities of what could have happened in their lives. But but I loved that whole chapter. I mean, it was so good. I just thought it was so interesting seeing these multiple different possibilities for Rand's life and the fact that he did kind of go crazy in most of them. So a little worried for Rand. And then also that everybody else in the party experienced that as well. That's kind of crazy. I, I just feel like it expedited the character development for all of these different characters in a way that is very realistic and kind of genius. So it doesn't really feel like it's cheating. It just feels like it's really brilliant. So I like that they all kind of leveled up through that experience and saw a lot of their faults and failures and things that they need to work on and things that they can't run away from. And I really like how that kind of played into the rest of the story and kind of helped them accept things that maybe they were running from. So well done. And then of course we have the ending of the book. And I just thought that it was so much better than the eye of the world. Not only was I far less confused on what was going on, but I feel like it was so much more epic because it was on such a grander scale. I was honestly really surprised that Matt blew the horn. I guess I just completely blanked on that whole prophecy where men saw him with the horn because I was really surprised. I was like, wait, 
Wait, Rand is, Rand's supposed to blow the horn! But that whole thing was epic when the heroes came down and we got to see these past figures. And the fact that they recognized Rand was so awesome. And Rand's just kind of like, all right, that's the last straw. I guess I am loose therein. I can't run from it anymore. Because <laughs> they all recognized him. And I just thought that that was such a good moment. And then the battle in the sky was awesome. I can't wait to see how they do that in the Amazon series. I hope they do it well. But I really loved how that whole end battle when Rand was fighting the Dark One was tied to everything that was happening down below. It just made it seem much more grand, much more large scale, and like a lot more things were at stake. And I was actually kind of surprised that that happened in this book. I don't know why. I just kind of thought that it would probably happen in like a book or two. But the fact that it happened in this book, I was like, okay, well, I have no idea where this, this series is going now because this battle that I thought was going to be led up to for a while just happened. So what's next? <laughs> just a few more things that I wanted to touch on before I talk about some negatives. <sighs> Inktar. When Inktar died, I cried. I was a little bit suspicious of him throughout the book just because he was really wanting that horn like a little bit too much. But after the chapter where he kind of had multiple lives flash before his eyes, he kind of had that revelation. I'm just, I'm just glad that he died with honor and that it was a good little redemption arc for him that ended well. And speaking of sad things, Tom's girlfriend? <laughs> what the heck? Why? Why did she have to die like that? That was so sad. I did like Tom in this book too, but Dina, she seemed great. She seemed like they were like a good thing and then brutally was killed. What the heck, Robert Jordan? I also loved all of the like really stupid petty games that kind of went in Carhine. Here's the actual pronunciation. I know I'm pronouncing it wrong. Leave me alone. Look, I struggle with some of the pronunciation things. It seems like it should make sense as Carhine, okay? I think it's like Kira, Kira, K, Kira, Oh God, <sighs> Karian? Is it pronounced Karian? 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 I don't know, like why, why can't it just be Carhine, okay? I just thought they were so funny, so dumb and so petty. And the fact that Rand did literally nothing and then immediately got on everybody's radar because of it, I just thought was so hilarious. <laughs> also in this book, uh, Pet and Fane was like creepy as shit. In the last book, he kind of just came across to me as like a Gollum type character. And he seemed much more like a pawn of the Dark One and kind of a weaker character. But in this book, I think that completely got flipped on its head for me. Holy crap, he was terrifying in the dungeons. How does Egwene think that he's just fine to talk to? Oh my gosh. And he just seemed way more intimidating in this book and definitely seemed like someone who had influence and power and not just a pawn that was being used. Such an interesting development for this book and I feel like he's gonna play a bigger part in the other books as well. Kind of very interested to see where that's gonna go. So there were really only like a couple of things that I didn't really like love that happened in this book. And the first of which is they lost and found that horn so many times. I just hate when books juggle an item like that. I mean, they literally had it at the beginning. They lost it in the initial Trolloc attack. They went after it again. Rand and Loyal got a hold of it. They had it in the city. They lost it in the city. They had to go to another city to get it. And they lost it literally right before Inktar and the whole friends showed up. I just thought that was like, okay, is this really necessary that we have to do this five times and lose it over and over and over and over? So that kind of drove me a little bit crazy. And then I kind of already mentioned, but the fighting between Matt, Perrin, and Rand at the beginning of the book, I just found to be a little bit dumb because it didn't fully make sense. And it was just kind of a thing through a lot of the book and I just wasn't, I just wasn't super crazy about that. And then I realized at the end of the book that Moraine was barely in it. <laughs> She was in the very, very beginning, and then she talked to Lane a little bit, and then she was doing some research in another city, but that was pretty much it. And I was kind of sad because I really like Maureen, so. And honestly, that's pretty much all that I didn't really like about this book. So someone suggested that I do a predictions section, and I think that this is a great idea, 
but I also think that it really sets me up to look really stupid. <laughs> I just feel like there's no way to accurately predict what's going to happen. I never would have predicted there to be like a multiverse, multi-dimensional thing in this series. This is just gonna be a segment where I make a fool of myself. I'm okay with that. So I'm just gonna make a couple of predictions, laugh all you want. I probably will after I read the next book. The stuff with the romance, I really don't know which way that's going to go. I mean, obviously Lanfear is going to be a temptress type character. So I, I expect that to be more of a thing in the next book. I really have no idea if Rain is gonna have to like choose one or if he's just gonna be like, the more the merrier. So in regards to the Dragon Reborn, I don't really know how Rand is necessarily going to act because he hasn't really been a person to just fully commit to this role yet, but I definitely think that he's going to have to make that decision in the next book. I imagine that the story is just going to completely spread like wildfire. I think it'll probably elicit a lot of reactions from the world. The Dragon Reborn is supposed to bring about the breaking of the world, so I imagine a lot of people are going to be absolutely terrified and want him to be killed. And then on the other side, I kind of expect people to actually work worship him in a way, kind of like a cult-like following. I don't think that Rand is going to really want to encourage this, but I think that some of the other dragons had a following of their own, so I imagine that those guys would just tack on to Rand, so maybe that will happen. I don't really know what the dragon is supposed to do at this point, though. Is he supposed to, like, start conquering things? Is he supposed to just go head first against the Dark One? I don't really remember what it said. I feel like it said somewhere that he was going to, like, kill all of his friends and family. <laughs> So that's a little unsettling. <laughs> as far as Egwene goes, I feel like she could become the Amarillin seat at some point. I don't know if that's gonna happen anytime soon because she still is kind of on like that base level of training, but I think it was mentioned somewhere that she had that kind of ambition and so maybe that will happen. And then with Nynaeve, I just feel like she is going to try to destroy the Aes Sedai from the inside. I just get that whole vibe from her. <laughs> so I don't know if that's going to end up in some weird conflict between her and Egwene because Egwene did kind of pick the Aes Sedai over Nynaeve in the last book, so that's kind of awkward. So that could be interesting. Maybe they become enemies. I'm sure you're just laughing. I'm... <laughs> I'd say such stupid stuff. This is purely for entertainment at this point. This has no value. This is just me making dumb predictions that most likely are wrong. I have no idea about Matt though. I really have no clue what his next steps are. So don't really have any predictions with him. Also, I don't really know about Perrin either. I feel like this book was just way more about Rand and Egwene and Nynaeve and some of those other characters and just really didn't say anything about Perrin and Matt. So maybe they're gonna have a bigger role in the next book, but I really have no idea about them. So that's pretty much my thoughts on the book. I'm really excited about reading this next book because I'm hoping that it kind of gives a little bit more direction to where the series is going to go. I really don't know what's going to happen now. I hope that there are a lot more kind of curveballs thrown because I'm telling you, the whole multiverse thing, that really threw me for a loop. It's just kind of wide open at this point. Thank you so much for watching. I honestly cannot believe the massive amounts of support that I got from that last video. This fandom has been just so welcoming and I'm just genuinely so appreciative. But anyways, thank you so much for watching. I hope you have a great week. Hope you have a great Thanksgiving and I will see you in the next one. See ya.